Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Lyle. I'm pastor of New Bridge Church here in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and also the founder of Transforming Truth. I can tell you how blessed I am that you're about to watch a message from Transforming Truth. I believe the message that you're about to hear is going to strengthen you. The Word of God's going to move within you, and you're going to learn something. I hope that every single one that is watching takes what they learn and applies it to their life because that's the way the truth will transform us from who we once were into who God wants us to be. So let's get into the Word of God together right now. Jeremiah 26, 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, who was the king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house, in the court of the temple, and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord. Speak to them all the words that I command you to speak to them. Do not hold back a word. It may be they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me, to walk in my law that I have set before you and to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I send to you urgently, though you have not listened then I will make this house like Shiloh and I will make this city a curse for all the nations of the earth. Now here comes the response. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets, those who were to have been representing God, the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, you shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, this house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? All, and all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priest and the prophet said to the officials and to all the people, this man deserves the sentence of death because he's prophesied against the city as you have heard him with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city. All the words that you have heard now, therefore, mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants for in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. So Jeremiah was called in his generation to release a really hard and urgent word. And he wasn't the first, and he hasn't been the last. And I'm telling you that though we are going to operate in love, and though we are going to have compassion, that there is a system and a spirit that predominates our culture, including the religious uh, sector of the culture. There is a spirit that is now intolerable of hard truth. Won't listen, won't agree, won't align, won't repent. And in the place of doing those things that are all throughout the history of God's people, when God wants to correct a nation, a person, or a people group, there has always been an option of repenting. But so often in Scripture, you find out that people had no desire to repent. And yet, even though God told them what would be the consequences of not repenting, they chose not to do it. And indeed, they suffered the consequences. We're living in a generation like that, friends. And the church can't go soft. It seems that we're comfortable on either side of the pendulum, but we can't, we, we, we can't, we can't swing where the, where the Holy Spirit wind blows. 
We're either going to be so nice that we are absolutely uh, ineffective in advancing the gospel and helping people become delivered from the sin that so easily captivates them. We're so soft and so sweet and so nice. We're so low sodium that our salt has lost its savor. We're either on that end of the pendulum or we're on the other end where foolish people that pretend to represent God pick at the, the funerals of military heroes that have died in battle and they use that as an opportunity to denounce those whose lifestyles are sinful and they don't agree with. And that's the other representation of Christianity. And it seems to be that the, uh, the culture wants us to fit in one or two. And the question needs to be answered, can we not operate in truth and still maintain the heart of God with love? Can we not represent the holiness and the grace and compassion of God? Or do we have to choose one at the expense of the other? Jeremiah was a lone ranger prophet for the most part. He was, in this sense, given a ministry that nobody in this room would sign up for. Given a ministry of constant pronunciation of warning, judgment to come, and he never saw a single convert. There's no record in the long book of Jeremiah's prophecy of a single person truly repenting. Probably why they called him the weeping prophet. The dude was crying constantly. He wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. He wanted to walk away. You and I would too if we're being obedient to the assignment, the assignment of the Lord and nobody's responding because our natural inclination is this. If I'm in God's will, I'm being the person God has called me to be. I'm doing the thing that God has called me to do. I'm speaking the message that God is releasing to the people I'm assigned to. Then surely great things are going to happen. And Jeremiah sits there while we testify that way and he shakes his head and he says, not always. And so I want to ask you today, if he's calling you to this, are you still saying yes? Are you willing to not simply answer the call, but to obey the call? Calls from God are often answered, but they're not in longevity always obeyed. And, and, and Jeremiah is going to serve as an example. So unclench if you want, but it'll be temporary because you'll probably get tight again here in a minute. Let's just start out with Jeremiah discerning the hour. Let's go back into the text. If you're new here, what I typically do when I teach or preach is I just go through a passage, walk through it, let the word of God speak, and then apply it as we go. So I don't think that we need to skip verse 1 because it shows us that Jeremiah knew the hour in which he was living. It says that all of this began to take place in the reign of Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim was a son, the son of Josiah, who was the former king of Judah, and here is this word. We're going to focus on this narrow word that God is giving in Jeremiah 26. So Josiah was an amazing godly king. He brought reformation to Israel after wicked kings had preceded him. He tore down the idols of his forefathers' generation. He called the nation of Israel back to repentance into what we call monotheistic worship, which just means worshiping one God and not the God of the Moabites or the Philistines or any of the other surrounding territories. Israel had moved so away from the heart of Yahweh that they were now indulging in some of the most heinous uh, pagan practices. They were burning their babies on the altar to Chemosh the God of the Moabites, and they were practicing all sorts of in incredible, unspeakable sexual defilements all in the name of worshiping these other gods. And so God rose up Jeremiah who took the throne as a, as a uh, grade schooler age, and as he reigned, he just kept bringing reformation to the land. So by the time that, uh, I said Jeremiah, Josiah, as, as before Josiah died, Israel had been turned back to the Lord. But let me tell you this, Past revivals do not guarantee lasting breakthrough. Because as soon as Josiah died, Jehoiakim, his son, Jeremiah ministered to the nation, but didn't influence his own son for godliness. And Jehoiakim took the throne and in 11 years undid everything that Josiah had done. It took decades for Josiah to do. In 11 years before he was murdered, Jehoiakim had turned the nation of Israel. I want you to picture it this way. It's when the, the, the forces of suppression are pushing down against sin. It came through the king. It was the law of the land. Surely there was true repentance throughout the land, but there were still pockets of people in Josiah's day that were obeying because they had to. 
And when Josiah, who was the, the inhibitor, was removed from the scene, Jehoiakim moved in. He said, all right, guys, holy days are over. We've been waiting a long time to party. I'm on the throne now. We're going back to where we were before my father came into the kingdom. So this is the time where Jeremiah is prophesying. And he, by the way, uh, more than once in the book of uh, Jeremiah, he prophesies directly against the sins of the king. He speaks directly to what is lacking in the king. He had a mission from God and t- at times. Part of it involved exposing the, sin- uh, the sins of the man on the throne. And so he spoke out against the specific sins against the leader of that nation. A word to the wise is sufficient on that. Let me just give this commentary. I'm not dwelling here. Uh, there may be some of you in the room that have a propensity to speak out against the leaders of the land. I just want to say this, whether it's social media, whether it's your own platform, pulpit, or ministry, whether it's your blog, whether it's your uh, exchange with your friends, I just want to, to caution all of us. Make sure whatever's coming out of your mouth, if Jesus is standing right there, he could nod and say, amen. Say it again. Your spirit's right on that. Your heart check is passing perfectly and your words are meant for the betterment of the person you're speaking out against. That's all I'm going to say about that and that applies no matter which way you vote in the next election. Jehoiakim was an ungodly man and Josiah was the prophet sent to speak against all that he, Jehoiakim, was initiating in the land. So let's look at it and let's watch how God operates. Prophets, Those of you that feel the pulse of the Lord to be a voice in this generation, those of you who have answered a call to stand and speak what the Lord gives you, whether you are a missionary to the nations, whether you are a pastor, whether you're teaching in academia, whether you're just simply a marketplace person who operates in the gift of prophecy and God gives you words of knowledge and at times you feel like you are called of God to stand up and speak out against the ills of our nation, let's learn how to do it well. And so we learn from Jeremiah here. First of all, it's just very clear that Jeremiah at this juncture was unashamed and he was thorough. He wasn't embarrassed of God. He wasn't embarrassed about God's ways. He wasn't embarrassed about what God was saying. He didn't open up his message of warning and denunciation with, I'm sorry I've got to say this, but I just want to be faithful to God. As if that would help the message. All that would do is make make it look like the prophet doesn't even agree with God. We need to stop apologizing for what God has said. We need to learn how to speak it in love and truth with sincere compassion for individuals that are caught up in the gears that we ourselves were once caught up in, but we don't need to so take the, the edges off of it that it doesn't draw the blood of conviction when it sticks them. So what does that look like? Well, it doesn't look casual, I can tell you that. And so look in verse 2. We see this assignment that God gives him to fill. Now listen to what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house. Speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord. Speak all the words that I command to you. Speak those to them. And then this, Jeremiah, do not hold back a word. Do not hold back a word. So what does that look like? So when he's talking about the house of the Lord, that's obviously the temple. And so he wants Jeremiah to engage in a very conspicuous, visible, public outcry against the sins of the nation and against the stubbornness of heart that Israel was experiencing. Ultimately, you're going to find out that God's not just sending Jeremiah to denounce and point a finger. Jeremiah is bringing with him an invitation for the people to step into what the Lord is doing. But they have to be alarmed. They have to be awakened. And so this comes forth. And I love the fact that the Lord says, um, let me just kind of apply it today. Um, Modern day 21st century prophet, don't hide behind your Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook account. You're not a keyboard prophet. It's not your primary place. Go and stand in the midst. Go and stand and speak. He tells them, go and stand in the middle of the court of the temple. So as all the worshipers are coming from all the cities of Judah, Jeremiah is not tucked over here in a corner with a happy little booth that says, if you have any questions, ask me. He's not being diplomatic. He's not being politically correct. He's not being passive. 
He's obeying. The call is to stand up and let your voice be heard. Instead of the alternative, which would be, hey, if anybody asks me, I'll tell them what I think. But Jeremiah's calling and some of your calling in this room. Again, this isn't everybody's calling, but this is some of your calling. To stand in the court of the Lord's house, speak to all the cities of Judah, say everything that I tell you to say, which by necessity means, Jeremiah, you need to remain as close to me as you possibly can because I'm going to tell you some things and you have got to hear not only my voice, but you've got to hear my tone. You've got to know my heart and my message. And so with a calling like this, again, with any calling, the number one prerequisite to fulfill your calling is intimacy with the Lord. Because I'm going to promise you something. Some people are just wired for conflict, confrontation, and contention. And they call that a prophetic gifting. Sometimes it's just the gift of being critical. Sometimes you're just gifted to be obnoxious. Sometimes you're just a pain. You say, Jeff, this is not very flattering. Good, I'm feeling Jeremiah's vibe right now. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that prophet, that, that voice, that person that stays in the secret place with God until he or she gets that message so that they know when God says, say everything I told you to say, don't leave off a word. Don't leave off the hard parts. Don't leave off the politically incorrect parts. Don't leave off the parts that are going to cause some friction between you and your family, between you and your faith family, between you and your, your, your co-workers, between you and your church family, all of that stuff. Don't leave off a single word. But Jeremiah, you keep pressing in, and when I whisper it to you, I'll give the whisper, you give the roar. And so that was his assignment. But look at verse 3, because some of you are struggling already with this, but, but get the heart of God on this. Why does God want to release the hard word? Because it's an urgent matter. They're not listening. Many words had come before this word. So it's an issue of them hardening their heart. And you don't break a hard heart with a Q-tip message. You bring a hammer. And so Jeremiah is going after their hearts, and this is what the Lord tells him to say. As he delivers this hard message, here's the motivation of God. It may be that they will listen. God wants them to hear. God wants them to listen. And if they'll listen and they've heard, they will turn every one of them from their own evil way. Now, this is God talking. This is not some judgmental fundamentalist that is pointing a finger. This is God saying there are some things being done that are evil. I, I give the measure of what is holy and what is evil, God says. And Israel had been involved and engaged in close to a decade of evil at this point. And God had been speaking to them all along, and they hadn't listened. And so he's sending Jeremiah to give this last pronunciation of what was to come. And he says, I, God says, I want them to listen. I want them to turn because I want to pull back from the disaster that I've already told them is coming, that I intend to do to them. Why, God? Why would you do that? Because of their evil deeds. What happens so often with religious people the two primary blind spots of Israel at this point was their nationalism, their patriotism, and uh, their, their, um, their sense of immunity and accountability. They thought, literally, we're the covenant people. We're the seed of Abraham. Ain't nothing going to happen to us. The pagans are the ones out there. We've got God. We've got the law. We've got the temple. We've got all of this substructure of what we believe, and we're trusting in this external stuff. And God's saying, yeah, but um, your hearts are very far from me, even though your lips still know the songs. And so he's saying, and he'd been saying to them, and so he's sending Jeremiah with one last whack of the hammer, and, and he's saying, I want you to repent. You see, the danger, I think, with a lot of prophetic people, and especially people that are given a hard and intense word to share to an audience, whether it's a gathered audience or just as they are going, speaking against ills in the culture. But the hard part is, is that sometimes the culture says, you actually sound like, more like Jonah than Jeremiah. Jonah eventually was obedient to his assignment to go out throughout Nineveh saying, God's gonna judge you, you better repent. God's gonna judge you, you better repent. Jonah did it. But Jonah did it like, I hope they don't repent. I hope they don't repent. Lord, I don't even want to give this message, but I'm going to obey. And he goes and sits up on a hillside. He's like, man, I hope I don't see this repentance happen. 
Why? Because Jonah wanted destruction to come. He wanted it. Jeremiah didn't. Jeremiah wept over the city. Read the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah's heart had the heart of the Lord where Jonah's did not. And so for us, friends, what I want to say is I want to make sure that if we're going to presume to speak on behalf of the Lord, be silent until you have his heart. If you're going to cry against the sins and the ills of a culture, remember that the scripture teaches he who has broken one commandment is guilty of them all. He who is offended in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. We tend to pick which sins are the worst, and it's usually the sins we never struggled with. And we tend to speak the loudest and the hardest against those. You see, if I took a hammer right now, and I hit right on this glass table, if I hit on this, it wouldn't punch out a singular hole in the one place I hit. It would shatter the whole thing. That's like the law of God. Your sins may have only touched one place in the law of God, but the whole thing is shattered, so we're guilty of it all. And if we'll remember that, there'll be humility in us when we are accountable and obedient to our call to speak against the sins of our nation. So he goes on a little bit further. We get down into verses 4 through 7. And Jeremiah's commission is to speak boldly and succinctly. Now, don't tune this out if you know that this is not your calling because the other side of this equation is you need to be prepared for God raising up people like this. They're going to totally mess up the seeker-sensitive movement, which, by the way, is already trickling to a slow death. They're going to totally mess up the paradigm that Christianity is viewed in our culture as being, we're the sweet guys, we're the nice guys, we're the happy guys, we're the everything's okay, God loves you guys. That mule has run. Well, mules don't run, they, they sit, but you know what I meant. We need to recognize that God's going to be raising up people like this. I can promise you, if you're younger and you start speaking these truths, older Christians, I'm middle-aged. Landon was asking me what middle-aged, and I, actually, on the way over to the church this morning, we were talking about how old somebody was, and I said, I, th I think this person's about my age, middle-aged, and Landon looks at me and goes, you're way past the middle of your life. <laughs> I'm like, he's a prophet, amen, he's speaking the truth. Um, if you're younger and you're going to say yes to this, I promise you, older people are going to resent you. If you're older, middle-aged, and you speak these things, younger, younger people are going to quickly want to label you as an old-fashioned, irritated, grumpy old prophet or prophet wannabe. And the reality is it's going to be the message of God. Why? Because as God had promised to send judgment to Israel, I promise you this, the Lord will judge the earth. It's unpopular, but it's wholly true. The Lord, prior to the Son of God returning to this planet, judgment will come, and 98% of the planet is not ready. And God is not going to just sit idly by and say, well, whom will believe will believe. No, he's going to raise up prophets. He's going to raise them up. I believe we'll see them in grade school. I believe we will see eight and nine-year-olds stepping forth, speaking the word of the Lord under an anointing that cannot be argued with. I believe we will see signs and wonders being administered by kids in the youth group while older adults debate whether those things are even allowed to happen anymore. I believe we're going to see proclamatory messages that will go forth under an unction that will literally have an equivalence to Jonathan Edwards' sinners in the hands of an angry God where people under the reading of the word hit the ground weeping and wailing over their sins. I believe that's coming again. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But if there is never a pinprick of conviction, convic uh, repentance won't happen. And there can't be conviction unless there is confrontation. So he's raising this up, and that's verse number four. I, I like this. There's no, there's no dialogue here. It's, it's a monologue. It's a dictate to Jeremiah. You shall say to them. Not Jeremiah, what do you think about this? Hey, Jeremiah, would you be comfortable with it? It's you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I've set before you. That's confrontation. We've lost that. 
we, we have lost it. When I say we, especially men and women in, in pulpits that have gotten addicted to happy audiences and growing audiences. And so they, they won't say the very things that need to be said in a culture that is, is just rapidly moving further and further into the abyss. And so there's got to be confrontation. And sometimes that, that feels to you when you're having to listen to it, it feels awkward, it feels uncomfortable, it'll make you mad. But the goal is not to confront just to kind of churn things up and walk away. It's not simply to agitate. It's to, it's to revelate. It's to bring revelation. It's to disclose the heart of God, the mind of God, the rhema word in a season where people are running off the fumes of what was said in the 80s and the 90s. As if God quit speaking, you know, when the TBN scandals happen and God's like, oh, I can't, I can't. Listen, he's got a fresh word for this generation. He's always had a fresh word. And some of those, some of the nuances of that word are going to be to awaken us to sound an alarm before the coming of the Lord in a forerunner generation where the messengers are consecrated unto the Lord and they're not giving themselves fully to the things of the culture, but they're repenting and they're distancing themselves and they're fasting and praying and seeking the heart of the Father and seeking the face of the bridegroom. And they're saying that in our generation may be the last before the Lord, before the bridegroom returns and our, our lamps have no oil. How will you know if your lamp doesn't have any oil? If somebody doesn't tell you, the only other way you'll find out is when it's time to light it and it's too late. And so Jeremiah was called to confrontation and he admitted, he, he, he shared with the people that they had accountability what was being said. Oh, God help us in this generation. He says, I want you to listen to the words, this is God speaking, of my servants, the prophets, whom I send to you urgently, though you have not listened. Do, do you see what the Lord's saying? He's saying, Israel, Jeremiah's another one. I've been sending you prophets. I keep sending you prophets. And I'm telling you, they're my servants. They're actually doing what I tell them to do. They're speaking what I tell them to say. They're operating where, I, where and when I tell them to operate. They are mine. I'm sending them to you. You've got to listen to them even though you haven't listened to them. And that's an indictment on my heart. That's an indictment potentially on your heart. Meaning this, we live in a generation where if the preacher says something that we agree with, it's of God. If he or she says something we don't agree with, uh, that's just them being them. And we have this filter, and it's U-shaped, Y-O-U. And it's what you want to hear, what you like to hear, what you think is true, where your little bend is. We all have that in us. The thing is, it needs to be unplugged. And any filter just needs to be what is true, what does is, what is God's heart, what does God's word say? Um, I, I would say this. I'm asking the Lord to give a sharpening of, of the prophetic edge and proclamation across the entire mission base. Not just on Sundays and Wednesdays up here, but across the entire mission base that the prophetic gifting would increase. It is happening. There's so many of us that are asking for that. The Bible says that we should earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. God says, put prophecy at the top of the list but it needs to be accurate and it needs to be bold and it needs to disclose the heart of the Father, not only in what he says, but in how he says it. But there is a danger, and I'll just give this before moving on to verse five. There's a danger that if it doesn't stroke our flesh, we don't let it enter our spirit. And friends, God is saying, that's what happened to Israel. He says, you have to listen to the servants I'm sending, the prophets I'm sending, even though you don't listen to them. So again, it's a chance for them to repent. And then he gives this warning. And this is where Jeremiah really, really uh, steps out there in risky obedience. He, he didn't even waver, but it's going to cost him right here in verse 6 because he delivers a very precise warning. He says, if, if you, God says, if you don't listen to my prophets that I'm sending, I will make this house. Remember where he's standing. Where is he standing? He's standing in the temple. He says, I'm going to make this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city, what city? Jerusalem. A curse for all the nations of the earth. 
Okay. Jeremiah is saying, if all of you don't listen to what God is saying through me right now, this is Jeremiah talking, the temple's going to get destroyed. And God says, just like I did Shiloh. Now, Shiloh was the residence, the geographical residence, the first place where the tabernacle found a semi-permanent home. Some scholars say that, that, that the tabernacle rested there as the place, the indwelling place of God's presence, worship, and sacrifice. They say that it may have been in Shiloh for over 350 years. And that was where Eli was ministering and his two wretched sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And so Eli, being the priest and being just dislocated in his heart from God, allows his two adult sons to operate at the front lines of the priesthood. And these two corrupt men who were supposed to represent God and supposed to re represent the people to God were making merchandise of the offerings that were being brought and they were sexually defiling the women that would come up with their family to bring sacrifices. They were totally opportunistic and using the things of God as an opportunity and a corridor to fulfill their carnal desires and their longing for money. And so God brought judgment the Philistines came up and they stole the ark of the Lord. And we're not given in scripture the moment where Shiloh was destroyed, but it eventually moved into oblivion. And the ark wouldn't return until David brought it back many years later. And what God is saying is, hey, I know you people know your history. Do you remember what happened to Shiloh? The first place where my presence dwelt in the tabernacle in the sense of the, the, the semi-permanent stationed dwelling. He says, I did it there, and I won't have a problem doing it right here in the temple. And so when you spoke out against the temple, um, Jeremiah comes against the heart of Israel's national pride, ancient Israel, because the temple was their pride, and Jerusalem was the place where God's glory would be revealed. And Jeremiah's got the audacity to stand publicly conspicuously in the court of the temple and say you have to repent or God is going to do to this temple where we're all standing exactly what he did to Shiloh and God will make Jerusalem which is intended to be a blessing to all the people on the earth he will make it a curse now how many of you know there weren't any amens in the crowd that day but he said it because he was a prophet that wasn't addicted to the approval of others. And that is an unmitigated requirement for everybody that will fulfill their ministry unto the end. Because I'm gonna tell you, our culture is going to cry loud and hard against biblical Christianity and the advance of it. And most, listen to me, most Christians will go into hibernation verbally they'll do it for a lot of different reasons but God is raising up some who will say I'm not going to operate in obnoxiousness but I'm also not going to operate in fear and I'm going to fulfill the assignment given to me so the warning comes and this is this is where I mean I, I think I can say this literally all hell breaks loose verse number seven the priest and the prophets the priest and the prophets along with all the people, heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. So Jeremiah is giving this word, and front and center are the spiritual leaders of Israel, the men who are supposed to be drawing Israel's heart closer to Yahweh and away from sin. And Jeremiah knows what is going on with these guys. And if you just picture it, picture the most intimidating, most well-renowned, recognized, modern spiritual leaders of your day. I'm not going to name any names. You think of the ones maybe that are admired. I'll think of the ones. And they're sitting on the front row, and God goes and tells you, go up there and preach against everything they're living. Preach against their beliefs. Preach against their leanings. Preach against their ministries. Say, so, well, Jeff, Jeremiah didn't say that. Friends, I'm going to tell you, 
The prophets and the priests knew that he was talking to them. You're about to find out, so go with me. Because here's where he encounters religious fury. This is where we don't think about them out there. This is where we start putting the microscope on us in here. It's the spirit of religion that comes first, hardest, and loudest against the prophetic word of the Lord for a season, for a generation, for a region. It's the status quo keepers that want to keep things calm, keep things sweet, keep the offerings coming in, keep the positions uh, secure, keep the house filled, keep the culture happy with us. It's the prophets and the priests of Jeremiah's day that were the greatest compromisers and therefore, therefore they were the first ones to give intense pushback. So I just say in verse eight, it teaches us as he encounters this religious fury, we better ready ourselves. (laughs) I got like six of you with me. I don't care if the rest of you listen, but I got six of you with me this morning. Come on. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak, so he said what he was supposed to say. And he said it to all the people. Watch this. Then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, <laughs> saying, You shall die. Man, I've been in some cold congregations before. I've gotten some mean looks, but I've never had anybody grab me by the lapel and say, you're going to die today. You're about to die. And this wasn't the only time that Jeremiah had this happen. They were all the time trying to silence him, and some of the times they just wanted to do it the quickest and most effective way, and that was to kill him. Can you recognize with me that this wasn't the culture? It wasn't the pagan, sinful culture. This was the religious culture. This was, can I say it this way, the compromised church. This was the culturally acceptable status quo, milk toast version of what it means to believe. And they were the guys, I mean, they couldn't couldn't get moved for the glory of God. They couldn't get stirred for the glory of God. But when Jeremiah started toppling their sacred cows, you see them all get riled up. It's the way it is, man. I'm going to vent for a second. I'm gonna just give me a second. All right, I'll get with it. Yeah, it was amazing. And we, listen, if you're visiting here, I hope you'll come back again when, someday. <laughs> we have a, an incredibly amazing, just beautiful spiritual family. Um, most of the people that hang here are really set for the kingdom. They're set for the glory of Jesus and they're set for the heart of the Father. Um, But this took a while to get to this place. My own personal journey involved, I believe they were well-intending people, but they, they, some of them, not all of them, some of them were the most religious, vindictive, mean-spirited, hostile to liberty, opposed to biblical truth that didn't fit their standard. And I can remember years of them never being moved to worship, never being moved to praise, never being moved to sacrifice, but being extremely moved in a quarterly business meeting to stand up and protest some toothpick-sized grievance they had in their heart. It's the spirit of religion. That's part of it. There's a lot more to it than that. And these guys, who were not moved for the glory of God, were moved to oppose, in this case, Jeremiah, who was sent by God. And we should ready ourselves for that. You realize with me at the end of the age that there will be a rampant turning away where Christians turn against pseudo-Christians in name. Nominal Christians will turn against children turning in parents. Parents exposing children. Christians reporting against other Christians. When I say Christians, I'm using the term as a cultural identification. That that's prophesied. That's the end of the age. Why? Because there is a minority remnant that will cling to the heart of God and the truth of God all the way till the end and many will fall away. And so we need to learn to uh, just anticipate the offended spirit. Because if you're going to fulfill your calling, you're going to offend some people. 
Is it, is it me? Or is it, uh, it's like the worst possible thing that we can do to somebody in this generation is offend them. I mean, it, I kind of feel like we're already preloaded with offense. Like, I mean, it's just like somebody tells you that you've offended them. You might want to just say, I think you were pre-offended, man. I think you showed up offended. I, I, I kind of think that was it. I, I've done this over the years because this spirit of offense thing has just been kind of a, a boil on the church for really on our culture too. It's, it's like when people, well, you, you offended me with what you said. And I don't do this as often anymore, but I used to say, like, yeah, I'm actually offended that you're offended at it. Because they want the preacher to apologize for whatever offended them. And I'm just like, man, I am sick of apologizing to religious people. I, am I offending you? Y'all, some of y'all, are y'all offended? Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm empowering you. I'm equipping you to deal with the offended spirit. So this is verse number nine. Jeremiah says this. Why have you prophesied? I mean, not Jeremiah. They said to Jeremiah, these are the religious leaders. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord saying, this house shall be like Shiloh. This city will be desolate without an inhabitant. Their, their patriotism has blinded them from the kingdom. They're so patriotic about who they are as a people and their national identity and their covenants and their promises and their history with Yahweh. And they're actually so blinded by their patriotism that they're, they're numb to the call of God to confess their sin. There's a little dose of that going around these days too, by the way. My fellow Christians... Your patriotism bows at the throne of Jesus. If your patriotism is, is getting you know, cross-grain with the word of God or the heart of God, you're too patriotic. You need to repent of whatever degree of patriotism you need to lose in order that you may be a person abiding in the love of God. That did not cost you a dime extra, but it felt good. And so now all the people gathered around Jeremiah and the house of the Lord. So it's a mob mentality. They're ready to tear the prophet to shreds all because he said what God said. Isn't that incredible? Verses 10 and 11 now. Th- th- what's amazing, by the way, you can read the rest of the chapter. Jeremiah does not die here, which is awesome. <laughs> when the officials of Judah heard these things, so they come up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets, so now the priests and the prophets have got the watchful civic eye on them. They got civic leaders watching them. Jehoiakim's henchmen come down from the palace. They hear there's an uproar in the temple. Jeremiah's standing there, you know, probably chilling, but they're trying to, to kill him. And so now the priests and the prophets have to make a bit of a civic case. And so they say to the officials and to all the people, this man deserves the sentence of death because he's prophesied against this city as you've heard with your own ears. So now you've got Jeremiah representing who some of you are going to be in coming decades. And the church is against him. And the culture and the government's against him. All the people, the civic leaders, and the religious leaders. So what's he going to do? Is he going to backtrack? Is he going to be diplomatic? Is he going to say, maybe we can compromise on this message God gave me? Maybe, maybe we can find parts that you'll sign off on, and maybe I can tone it down a little. Sorry, got caught up in the moment. And I, I, I don't know how to stress this enough, but, and I see what time it is, but um, we're, we're going to give an account for what we did with our assignments. No, I mean, we really, really are. And not everybody's assignment is the same, but the one thing that all of our assignments from God share is an accountability factor. Like I'm literally going to stand, literally, I'm going to stand before Jesus. And I don't know how it will all work, but I know that it's going to happen. And I will give an account for how I influenced and shepherded and led that's, that's Bible. I'll give an account. All of your leaders here will, but it's not just leaders, it's all of you. We give an account, and I, I don't, I don't want to give an account and try to make excuses for why I fulfilled 90% of it. 
and then to reason with God that the other 10% might have caused trouble, and by hedging on the other 10%, it gave me a little bit more longevity to where I could hit the people, more people with the nine. And you start negotiating with the Almighty. By the way, nobody's ever won a negotiation with God, not in the sense where their will opposed his. And so Jeremiah is all alone. And he's encountering religious fury. And the government's now gotten in on it. And the people hate him. And so we get to the last few verses, and I'm just about done. Here's his unwavering message. As Jeremiah remains steadfast, hear this. Church, we must be a steadfast, surrendered people. We have to remain this. We have to fight to be steadfast as unto the Lord uncompromised and uncompromising. And we have to stay surrendered. That means what he told you last year, he reserves the right to tweak this year. And if you're close, you'll hear him and you'll obey. For Jeremiah, it looked like this. He has this unwavering message. So remember, he's surrounded. They're ready to kill him. They've just asked for the sentence of death to be brought down from the civic leaders. And look, this, Jeremiah doesn't have the book of Jeremiah. He doesn't know how the rest of the chapter plays out. So he's thinking, I got one more shot to make sure I get this last message out there. And so he says to all the officials and all the people, the Lord sent me. Your God sent me to prophesy against this house and this city. All of the words that you've heard. And then Jeremiah tells him what to do. Mend your ways, therefore. Mend your deeds. And obey the voice of the Lord your God. And here's the promise. And the Lord will relent of the disaster that he's pronounced against you. So Jeremiah is the human voice for a heavenly message. And Jeremiah doesn't take what could be his last moment and go still and silent. He says, no, 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 no. Y'all are mad at me. Please don't be. Be mad at God if you must be mad. Go ahead and be mad at him because all I'm doing, I am the mailman. I didn't write the bill. I'm delivering it. And everything I've said to you just came from God. And the reason why he wanted me to tell you this really hard, urgent word is because he does not want to fulfill what he has promised to fulfill if you don't repent. And what Jeremiah is trying to do, he's trying to get them to say, hey, it's tough, it hurts, it's a hard word, it's going to require a ton of repentance and change. But if you will, then God will not bring the disaster that I just told you he's ready to bring. That's the way you listen to a prophetic word, by the way. Um, don't just be offended at the confrontation. Follow it all the way through and say, I got to weigh the consequences of what I do with what I'm hearing. And that's what Jeremiah was calling to do. And so I love this, verse number 14. We've only got one left, so worship team, come on up. Look, look, just look at the laid down life of Jeremiah. He says, but as for me, behold, I'm in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. He's completely free. Completely free of the people. Completely free of the religious expectation. Completely free of the cultural angst coming against what he has pronounced. He's completely free. Why? He's like, man, I feel so good. I obeyed God. I didn't let a single word get overlooked. I did exactly what I'm supposed to do. I'm all up here in the temple. I'm, Lord, you see me? I'm exactly where you told me to go. I'm saying it the exact way you told me to say it. I delight to do your, your will, O oh Lord. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. And, and Lord, I, I, I release this. I'm so free. And he says to people, and since I'm so free, I don't care if you kill me or not. Because I'm free of fear. I'm free of your opinion. I'm free of the insatiable need for you to think I'm awesome. I'm free of the temptation to tweak God's message to produce a, a greater admiration of me and you. He's free. Free enough to die. Uh, without being too cryptic, I will say this. I believe that there are people alive today in the United States of America that will die because they refused to budge off the assignment of God. I believe they'll die here in this nation 
I believe they'll die worldwide when our task missionaries take the gospel into the darkest places, the darkest regions on earth. Some of them know that they'll die when Sin 56 trains national Africans to go into heavily Islamic villages in different parts of, of that continent. They know some of them will die. Often, uh, when missionaries, especially in times past, would be sent into places where the opposition of the gospel was so intense and so renowned, and they were going on a short-term trip, they buy one-way tickets because they know the likelihood of them coming back is next to nothing. They know that they'll give their life for it. That's what I'm talking about. Jeremiah says, do with me whatever you want, and then he ends it. It's just so cool, man. I don't know. It's like he could have ended it with that really... Wow, Jeremiah's really sold out. He, he's like, kill me if you must. I have done the will of the Lord. It sounds kind of Charlton Heston-esque. I mean, it just, it, it just sounds so, wow. But then he throws this in. But let me say one more thing. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me unto you to speak all of these words in your ears. Man, I'm inspired, man. I'm just motivated by that. It's like, y'all are nice, so y'all aren't threatening, but he's in a threatening situation. And it's like, yeah, I, have, I gotta scratch the itch one more time. Just in case you missed it. If you kill me, you're heaping sin upon sin, just so you know, just so you know. When I ask those of you that felt in your spirit that your assignment and calling is like that of Jeremiah's in his day, I'm going to ask you if that's you to stand. And remain standing. If you're on the worship team and that's you, if you've got a hand free, lift your hand. If that's you. You need to be that man and that woman from this point on. And you need to press in to the Lord more closely and urgently and more single-mindedly than you ever have before. You have to divorce yourself from the distractions that plague the church and you have to be operating in a sing with a single eye that it may be your whole spirit may be filled with light. You cannot afford to dilute your assignment you cannot be all things to all people. You cannot speak to everything. You have to know and stay in that place where the Lord has called you to use your voice and spend your life. You have to tarry in his presence. And you'll know when you're released, but I'm going to tell you, That release, he intends to be sooner rather than later. And if you will press into him and you will deny the attempt to alloy your soul with all the other things in our culture, all the other things in religion, all the other even good things that you might do, if you'll refuse to be alloyed and you will stay singularly focused, Jesus, then the anointing will come. I'm not telling you people will love you. As a matter of fact, the passage says most won't. But I am telling you when you stand before the Lord, you'll have no regrets. I want the rest of the congregation to stand.